Well, this afternoon I'm sitting here with Frank Davidson, and Frank is going to share with us some information about his service in World War II. Hello, Frank. Hi, Janelle. <laughs> Hi. So, Frank, tell me, you were born in Salem, Illinois, and you live in Salem, is that correct? That's right. Yeah. You want to tell us a little bit about your family? Yeah, there were five of we children. Um, we lived on a farm. All of us went to country schools mm -hmm. and then on to high school. And uh, what else? Well, I think you graduated from high school early. Were you extra smart? <clears throat> Um, I, I wanted to start school when I was four years old because I, when my big brother oh, went to school, I course. wanted to go to school with him. <laughs> but they kept me until I was five, and then at five I started school. Yeah. So consequently, I graduated from high school when I was 16. That's fabulous. And class of 1941. 41. All right. So now what we're going to talk about is your your service. And so you served with the 453rd Bomb Group. Yes. Okay. And here we go. No, 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 it's just I've touched something here that's gone to sleep. There we go. So you reported for duty in Chicago. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So were you 16 or 18 when you volunteered for the service? Uh, 18. You were 18. It wouldn't mm -hmm. take you yet, right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. So you, en en you enlisted in Chicago, and then they sent you to St. Louis. To Jeff Jefferson Bay. Ooh, I'm getting a lot of feedback. Which, no. You can put it down just a little bit because it's turned up. There you go. Try that. I went to Jeff. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I went to Jefferson Barracks at St. Louis, Missouri for okay. starting a basic training. Uh -huh. okay. and then, then we were there for our shots and vaccinations, uh -huh. learning our left foot from our right foot, <laughs> and remembering to mind the drill sergeant. Yes. And then you did, is that the St. Louis College Training Detachment? Then we moved from Jefferson Barracks to uh, Jefferson College there in St. Louis, and uh, we were quartered right across the street from Powell Hall in St. Louis uh, in a large building that had been converted into barracks and meeting rooms, etc. Our beds and bunks were where the automobiles were normally parked. Oh my gosh. Up on the fifth or sixth <laughs> floor. Oh my, is that pretty typical of what your bunks would have looked like? Is that your barracks or something similar? Sim similar to that, yes. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. They have more shoes than we had. <laughs> I bet. Then you went to? <coughs> uh, from St. Louis, we went to San Antonio, and when we arrived there, they more or less slammed the gate in our face. Uh, there was really no need for more applicants for pilots, co-pilots, uh, and uh, you had your choice then of becoming a uh, airplane mechanic or radio operator or just a plain uh, member of the Army Air Corps. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was a terrible disappointment to some of the guys. It really shook them up. But my brother, who was in this type of training in California, had forewarned me of all of the uh, opportunities that they were presenting even to him to get out of the uh, 
to go into some other field. How many pilots did they have at that time trained? Supposedly they had 47,000 pilots. Remarkable. Last night I looked, I started to look up to make sure that I was getting that number exactly right. And when I got out the book, it had 859 pages, so I didn't, <laughs> I didn't go far. Oh my, that's a lot of pilots, that's for sure. Looks like you had a little time to smile, relax. These are some of the guys that we met when we were in San Antonio. And we were moved from, or I, I selected the radio training and was therefore transferred to uh, Scott Field at St. Louis or, or Belleville, Illinois. Was that a factor in your decision to become a radio operator? Uh, yes. <laughs> Belleville is only 50 miles from my home, so right. it meant that uh, mm -hmm. at least I would have an occasion to come home. Mm -hmm. This is my brother Carl. He graduated from Luke Field in January of 1944, the class of 44A. And on his way home, uh, he did get a furlough after his wings and, and commission. And he stopped by at Scott Field to say hello to me. That's just me relaxed on the steps of the barracks. I was close enough to Salem that I would, uh, on a Sunday morning, I could catch a train from St. Louis, or just the easiest way was just at Belleville, just to hitchhike. And as long as you were in uniform, which you definitely were, uh, people were very happy to pick you up and and it was surprising some when I arrived at Salem was well now where do you want to go and I'll take you there and so they would take me to uh, my sister's home or to my home. <laughs> nice. People were very kind and courteous. Then uh, after finishing radio school, well while at radio, when I arrived at radio school, let's put it that way, from San Antonio, that was our first opportunity to be in winter uniforms, always before I'd been in khakis. And when got to Scott, why well, they put us in winter uniforms. And I broke out with a rash all over, I think. Anyway, um, it soon went away, and but then I had a cough and so forth, and I went to uh, the infirmary, and they said, "Oh, you've got a cold. And here, take this. And you'll be over." So that I did, and then about two days later, here the ambulance pulled up in front of the barracks and said, where's Davidson? And I said, that's me. And they said, get your gear. We're putting you in quarantine for so many weeks. I've forgotten whether it was six or eight or whatever it was. Quarantine with scarlet fever. Oh my. So I had, I, I felt good and I had my radio there and I just laid there and listened to the radio for <laughs> eight weeks. My the gosh. only thing across the hall, they see we were in isolation. The people across the hall were in there for spinal meningitis. Oh. And that's another story because the parents would come there and they would leave crying. Oh, yeah. yeah. They lost some men there. Yeah. Wow. But I recovered my my room at the hospital. Where was the hospital? They're at Scott Field. At Scott. Mm -hmm. But I became well acquainted with the doctors and nurses there because they knew I was just sitting over there with no one to visit. And, and they liked the music that I had oh. on my portable radio. And so we <laughs> got well acquainted. Oh, 
that's nice. Then I went from, after finishing radio school, you learn the Morris Code, receiving, sending, uh, building a, a radio set. Uh, all of that was part of the training. Then I went from there to Yuma, Arizona for gunnery school. And there's nothing like being in Yuma, Arizona in June and July. You, <laughs> you fry on both sides. Oh. Oh. Then from gunnery, uh, I received a 30-day or 30-day, I don't think it was, anyway, I got a, a furlough home. Then I was sent to Lincoln, Nebraska for assignment. And uh, while I was there, I called my parents and they said, be sure and call Mrs. John uh, Brian while I'm there, and uh, or Mrs. Yeah, Mrs. John Brian, and uh, so I said, "Who's that?" And they said, "Well, that's William. That's William Jenning Brian's brother." Yeah. And uh, oh, so then I began to put the pieces together and realize who I was supposed to call. So I did call Mrs. Brian. And uh, she and I had such a good visit because I could answer most of the questions about people that she remembered in Salem. And then she said, well, we'd like to have you out for dinner some Sunday. And I said, that sounds good. And she said, but Mr. Bryan isn't feeling well. And uh, so that kind of ended the conversation. and. I moved from there. I was assigned then to uh, go to uh, Gowan. Gowan Field in Boise, Idaho. And it was at Boise, Idaho, our train, our crew was put together. Uh, that's where we met the various guys that had been in training for their particular part of the crew. And we were there for eight or ten weeks and then finished up in November, early November. Mm -hmm. And there you are. There's the crew. Down on the first row on the far right is Robert Preston. He trained as our bombardier, but he did not go overseas with us. Uh, he was kept, I suspect that he ended up in B-24s in the Pacific. Mm. Wow. And that's you top left? Can yes. Can you tell me just a little something about each of those men? Okay. T starting with myself, I'm in the back row on the left, and next to me is Don Wills from Iowa. He was married to Ina, and they had one daughter, Joanne, and so Ina and Joanne came to Boise and lived with them while he was still stationed in the States. The tall, slender fellow is Frank Mulconry from Chicago. He was 18 and hadn't been in the service but just a few months. Uh, Joe Edwards? Joe Edwards was from Pennsylvania, a former industrial arts teacher in high school. Uh, he was married and his wife also came to Boise. Then Hilton Lane was our tail gunner. Uh, he was from Maine. We jokingly kidded him about the fact that he was further from home when he was in Boise, Idaho, <laughs> than he was when he was stationed in England, because yeah. he was away up there in Maine with his home. <laughs> and the last one on that row is Joseph Sopper from Pennsylvania, and he was the belly gunner or 
the ball turret operator and gunner. Front row again and starting on the left is Dave Park from Iowa and uh, then Doug Leavenworth from uh, Chicago suburb. Uh, then he, he was our pilot. Then uh, Bob Malik from Pennsylvania and his girlfriend came to Boise, Idaho and we enjoyed going to their wedding while we were there. Then the next one is, as I mentioned, Robert Preston. Uh, I'm not sure where he was from, but he did train with us as a bombardier, but he did not go over to England with us. Yes. Oh, here we are just goofing around. That's us. <laughs> we, we had a good time in Boise. Boise is a nice town, particularly in the autumn of the year. A little different than Yuma, Arizona? Yes, very <laughs> welcome. <laughs> and this is another shot at uh, Boise. So you got three days leave before they sent you overseas. Yes, we ended up, everyone got a three-day delay en route, and I certainly enjoyed coming back to Salem and being with my parents and family. And this is early or in November, and Mother said, we're not going to have a going-away dinner for Frank. We're going to have an early Thanksgiving dinner. Mother, there was that kind of a sport that she didn't want to put too much pressure on. So we had a wonderful Thanksgiving dinner and uh, then my sister and her husband drove me from home to St. Louis to catch the train to somewhere. The train left, at we had to be there at 11 and we left, pulled out at 11.30. We had no idea where we were going but we slept well, and the next morning when we awoke, we were just coming back into the United States. We had taken the train from St. Louis to Chicago, to Detroit, to Canada, and we came across Canada at full speed ahead, and then came back in to the States and uh, went to Boston area. And then you were on the USS Mount Vernon, which was previously a luxury liner, but it probably wasn't a luxury liner when you were on it. Uh, no, <laughs> the, the luxury part had been removed and, and bunks and uh, it, it was loaded. The bottom portion of the ship was loaded with ground crew and ground troops. And the Air Corps happened to be based on the upper level. Um, we knew not where we were going. We, they gave us a mosquito net in our equipment, which threw us for a wonder. We, we had no idea why, why we would have a mosquito net in our gear, but we just went for the ride anyway. Then, after traveling for seven days, we seemed to come to a stop out in the ocean and we stayed there until dark and then when darkness set in we fired up and went full speed ahead somewhere and we went to bed we slept well then but the next morning when we woke up and went out on deck here we were look first of all there was fog all around the boat. You could hardly see your hand in front of your face. And when the fog lifted, here we could see sunken ships all around us, just several of them in Liverpool. We had arrived in the night in Liverpool 
and we had waited out in the ocean for darkness because of the German submarine waiting at the entrance to the Straits of Liverpool. But we made it safely. Then we quickly loaded from the boat into train and went to Old Buckingham, England. Before you left Boston, you had a little cultural experience, right? Right. The, <laughs> the last night in the United States, we had a, uh, an evening at the Shangri-La. Uh, that's Smokey and Mo and Pop and Ed and myself. On that last night in Boston. Yeah. Yes, yeah. last night in Boston. Then we, from the Shangri-La, we went back to our barracks. And when we entered the barracks, someone said, don't go to bed, said we ha we're having a shakedown inspection. And that means that you put all earthly possessions that you have with you on your bunk. And so we did that. We got out our uniforms and this and that that we were taking with us. But we were in need of rest. So we laid down on top of all of this stuff and went soundly to sleep. We slept well until the next morning the Major was in our barracks before we were awake. <laughs> He was most unhappy with the disrespect that we airmen were showing to a major in the Army Air Corps. That's funny. This is to show where old Buckingham is, especially for our American friends that don't know that much about English yeah. countryside. That's neat. Old Buckingham was not too far from Norwich. We always took the train from Norwich, or we could catch it at one of the uh, other stops near Old Buck. Old Buckingham is now privately owned, and 95% of the military buildings are gone. The runway is still there, and that is used by a uh, glider club for their operations. Four fifty third bomb group. Uh, it was made up entirely of B twenty four Liberator bombers. B twenty four Liberators are four motored twin tail bomber planes. They're not a pretty airplane, but they're a very successful. Uh, there were more B-24s built for the World War II than any other plane. This is our crew in our working clothes. We've just returned from a bombing mission and they wanted to take our picture. There you are, all dressed up. Can you give me the names, Frank, please, from the top row, left to right? Mm -hmm. Top row, left to right, Joe Edwards, David Park, um, Doug, the pilot, Doug Leavenworth, and uh, Robert Malik, co-pilot, and myself, Frank Davidson, as radio operator. Then again, uh, starting with the left in the front row is Joe Sopper, and Pop Wills, Mo, Mo Conry, and Hilton Lane. This picture shows a man that flew with us, so oh, probably six or eight missions. I'm not sure why he was separated from his crew, but he was trying to catch up. And so he would fly as a, a gunner on our crew to, to make up his quota. 
the quota for flying was 25 missions. After 25 missions, you could come home. And this was just to show that your unit was involved with D-Day, even though you weren't there yet. Right, yeah. We did not arrive then. We weren't there. This is a weather ship. Nice paint job. Yes. Readily visible. This is a map of your missions. On the left are all the locations where we went on missions. All of our missions were in Germany. Our last mission, which would have been number 22, if it would have been completed, uh, we were on our way to Czechoslovakia. And just when we approached the Czechoslovakian border, they called the mission back. This is your crew. That's the crew. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that's the B-24. Mm -hmm. We stayed together all during our overseas time. And then when we got back to the States, uh, the last time that we were all together was when we were at Bradley Field, Connecticut, when we arrived at Bradley, and I think all of us came into New York before we started scattering out for Maine, Pennsylvania, Ohio, and mm -hmm. so forth. Doug Pilot, our He was our nose gunner. You want to tell the funny story? Oh. Or not? Okay. Let's, let's, let's skip that. Let's get. Here you are getting a medal. Yes. Uh, Major Heaton is giving me the Air Corps medal. Real nice guy. And the nice thing about it, after that, I received two more air medals. The crew uh, received a total of three air medals. It was one of the coldest winters that England had ever had, uh, the winter of 1944 and 45. This is not our crew, but it gives you an idea of what couldn't happen overnight before you began to take off in the morning. We'll just kind of go through some of these missions. If there's anything you want to add on any of them, just mm -hmm. let me know. All right, yes, this, we flew a total of 21 missions and to various locations. We flew a number of different planes with different names. You'll notice the names of many of the, the planes up in the upper left-hand corner. Magneburg was a place where we visited more than once. The, uh, The oil production there had to be stopped, and we tried to take care of that. Oh, February the 22nd, yes. That was, that was when we flew anything that could fly. Uh, it was just amazing the mass of airplanes that were all in the air headed across the channel into Germany. Our effort was to bomb every bridge, every railroad junction, anything to prohibit the Germans from getting supplies from the ocean inland. Okay. 
submarine bar at Kiel, we tried a different approach to uh, the target there. We went directly to another city, and then as we got near Kiel, the men in the back of the plane opened up bundles of aluminum foil icicles like we used to decorate the Christmas trees. Bundles of that, they threw those out by the handfuls, bundles and bundles of them, and, and uh, so much so that it uh, just completely botched up the German radar system. <laughs> We immediately made a left-hand turn and got into Kiel, got in there with very little uh, aircraft and got on our way. This was the day that was most unusual. Uh, anything normal about it was not there. The normal flight would have left early of a morning, and they did. And our crew was not selected to leave on the early morning flight and so we slept in and we went to uh, after sleeping till about 11 o'clock we got up and went to the mess hall for a meal when we returned to the barracks here was the charge of quarters waiting for us and telling us to get immediately to the briefing room that we were to fly on an afternoon mission so that's what we did it was a different type of mission because we all left the briefing room together. But then our crew, along with three other planes, was assigned to separate ourselves from the group and fly to Essen to bomb the runways at Essen, Germany. Essen was a sizable industrial city heavy industry, lots of artillery, and very accurate. But here were the four of us uh, striking out. We were to bomb the runway because Germans had a new jet fighter plane that required a longer runway for takeoff and for landing. So the best way to start giving them a bad time about their new jet fighter was to destroy their runway. So that confined them to, they supposedly had only four bases that had the long runway. So that cut it back to three. We got shot up badly there uh, there just uh, all kinds of things happened all of a sudden. Uh, the plane began to swirl downward and uh, you began to think that you were going to go back over the target a second time was my feeling that you were just curving and going to be going back. But Doug got the plane straightened out we were going down all the time and supposedly we were hit three different by three different uh, flak shots. Uh, this photograph shows us that uh, we did, uh, we kept coming lower and lower to the ground, but we finally uh, we located a, uh, an abandoned German air base in Belgium at St. Tron where we were able to land and get the plane down. Something that not only interfered with our flying 
uh, a crippled plane was the fact that this was an afternoon flight. The photographs of the results of the mission didn't turn out well because of the darkness. And here we were flying lower and lower and getting darker and darker. As we approached the final, uh, we were on our final approach and I suddenly realized that we might be reported as missing in action. I didn't want that to happen, so I quickly just, without any authority or anything, I just put on, got on the key and tapped out uh, Leavenworth crew, okay. And I had hardly finished okay until I heard the wheels of the plane screeching on the <laughs> runway. And that was a happy, happy day. <laughs> The, uh, when we, uh, we did land and a ground crewman came out and met us and told us where to park the plane and that he would come out and help us uh, have a look at the plane the next morning if we would participate. So he brought lots of screwdrivers and we took panels off the front of the plane to get inside to see what all was wrong. There were many things wrong with it, some that he could repair and some that he couldn't, so we did the best that we could. And by working on it for two days, on the third day we had it ready to go back in the air again. Not, not complete by any means, but enough to get us across the channel. This photograph shows the uh, ground mechanic on the left side. Then the man with the hat on is the pilot, and that's Dave Park, the navigator. Then lying on his belly in the center of the photograph is Bob Malik, and you'll notice the, the uh, parts of the plane, that's right outside my window. That's where some of the damage was done. <laughs> After we finished putting the plane together and got her up in the air, we headed for the White Cliffs of Dover, the narrowest point in the channel for crossing. As we approached the channel, well, first of all, a limping plane is just bait for a German fighter plane to come in and wipe out immediately, but thank goodness we had good luck all the way to the channel. Then when we got to the channel here, a British Spitfire came out to meet us, and we gave him the proper recognition, and from there he came over and escorted us back to our base at Old Buck. We appreciated and enjoyed his doing so. Jimmy Stewart was our operations officer. He, uh, who had flown 20 combat missions, and uh, they decided he was too important a man to, to be flying combat, and so he, he just constantly was working his way up. He, he uh, was a great guy to, to uh, have supervising. Um, he often would stand at the back of the briefing room. I never heard him stand up and give directions to anyone or anything, but he was always there to see that things went right. Then as the sun went down and his evening hours approached, you would find him at the piano playing ragtime Cowboy Joe. <laughs> You had a little downtime. Born with, yes. We uh, were sent there for rest and relaxation. And it was just a nice break 
Oh, we just goofed off, did bicycle riding and horseback riding and a change of diet from the military mm -hmm. and uh, just a good... By the way, while we were there, we received words that President Roosevelt had died. That's where we were. These are just sites, not particularly from our targets, but just uh, in general, um, showing how it looked from the air. Jimmy Stewart made the front page of Life magazine back in September of 45. The Yanks want a draft beer, it says. That's funny. <laughs> One thing, can I make a comment on sure. the beer? Um, when we came home, we flew from England to the Azor Islands. And when we got to the Azor Islands and got off the plane, we got there in the middle of the afternoon. Somebody said, oh, the PX is down here and, and they have milkshakes. So we all went down and had a milkshake because in England we weren't allowed to have milk or ice cream due to the uh, lack of pasteurization. So we all went down and had a, a chocolate shake. And then I think as while we were leaving the PX, they said, well, the, the NCO has opened up and they have American beer. So we went right down and had a beer <laughs> on top of the chocolate shake. It's a good diet. <laughs> This, uh, it was in the local paper that says that you're home. This is a very enjoyable time. Back home, I uh, got there uh, about the 21st of June, and then I had my 21st birthday on the 28th of June. So I was back from combat in time to be home on my 21st birthday. This is a recap of your world service tour. All the places that you were stationed or trans transferred through, yeah. That looks like a lot of places, but then that's... During the uh, time that I was home from overseas, these are all classmates of mine Ward and Merle Duncan, Charles Erler, and Marvin Days. We all went to school together. Uh, Merle was a pilot of a B-17. Ward was a colonel in the engineering department. Uh, Marvin was in the South Pacific, I believe. And Charles Zilver was a gunner in a B-17 in Europe. This was the cake that was baked by uh, the Duncan boy's sister, Evelyn. A very nice treat. Andy Lowe uh, was Jimmy Stewart's roommate until he got either shot down or went down and captured by the Germans. And he was kept there for some time and then finally on the death march that uh, those were taking place in the spring of 45. On the death march, they would just be marched all day long, and no food, no shelter. They, uh, they 
survived a miserable time. But he, uh, he lived through it all and uh, they reached uh, some of the allied forces and were then returned to normal conditions. These are men that I met at Old Buckingham in June of this year. They were quite surprised to see me. I, I hadn't given anyone at Old Buck uh, any notice of my coming, and so they were quite surprised. And they acted like I was a long lost son and go kill the fatted calf. And this you said you're trying to gain the Distinguished Flying Cross for your pilot, for Doug the pilot. Leavenworth. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. uh, I talked to the government office last week about it, and they need his social security number. They yeah. are concerned about his army serial number. They want his social security number. So. That's just uh, a hold up for now. I hope it goes through successfully. So, Frank, thank you.